Hey, what's cracking? How are you doing today? Hope that you're doing well, my friend. Hope that everything is going your way. I really, really do. Uh, I'd like to thank you for clicking on the video. If you've never watched one before, my name is Ricky Dye, and I went to prison for murder in the state of Oklahoma when I was 15 years old. And I was there for 20 and a half years before I got out. 20 years, 5 months, 29 days to be exact. Can't do anything about what I did that sent me to prison. That's in the past, and unfortunately, we can't change our past. But what I can do is do everything in my power to see that another kid doesn't do what I did. Save another family from being the victim the way that family was. Such a senseless, senseless crime. I take full responsibility for everything I did, and if they would have put me in prison for the rest of my life, I feel I would have deserved it. But since they have given me a second chance, I don't mean to squander it. I'm never going to let my mama down again. I'm not going to let my family down again, my wife or myself. Uh, and with that, I try to make these videos uh, in hopes that some other kid won't do the same thing. Because right before I did my crime, I, I said something about doing a crime. And my mom said, you know what they do to kids in prison? And, you know, I didn't know what they did to kids in prison. But if you watch this channel, you'll know. You'll know exactly what it was like to grow up there. Uh, so if you do would like to watch the channel, it'd be best if you start at the beginning Because that's where I started when I was 15 what happened how I ended up in that place How it ended up that the whole thing went down the way it did what it was like to be certified as an adult and sent to prison and and raised by criminals and convicts That's what this story is about and generally I jump right into the story and I tell you some horrifying things that I may have been through And I try to make it entertaining But at the time I swear to you there was nothing entertaining or fun about it. And I hope that you take that from the story. But today, before I jump into the story, I feel that it would be amiss for me not to address the elephant in the room because I haven't been around for a while, for those of you who watch all the time. You know, I've been missing for two, three weeks. I've been missing trying to get my health back right and my mental health back right. And I'm going to say, say thank the Lord, I think that that's happened. Uh, during the time I've been away, they uh, have done some tests on my stomach. My, my sickness, me being sick all the time, is a direct result. My intestines and stomach get upset as a direct result of my nerves. So when I get upset, I end up getting sick. So all that is attached in your nervous system. So they have found a medication that helps me mentally and also calms those nerves in my stomach. And I think that it's working because today I woke up not sick at all for the first time since I don't know when. Months and months, maybe over a year since I woke up feeling okay the way I did today. I want to thank everyone who's checked on me in Messenger, made kind comments to me, texted me on my phone. I won't take the time to list all the names because if I do, it would take a large part of the video because there's that many of you who have checked on me. But you know who you are and I want to thank you. Because when I was down deep in the dumps trying to get my head back right, I would read your comments and you guys picked me up. And I want to thank you for helping me out of a dark hole. I want to give a shout out to David LaRue and Mike Bradley. Both those people. I never ask people for money. But if someone sends money to help me out, I feel like it's important that I recognize them for it. I never say the amount because amounts don't matter. It's the thought behind it. So Mike Bradley, David LaRue, thank you guys for helping me out. My time and need. I appreciate it. I want to give a shout out to the Riders and Dyers. The riders who ride till the wheels fall off and the dyers keep riding even when they do. I mean that from the bottom of my heart because you guys have proved that. That you will be there till the end. And that means the world to me. And uh, I would gladly help any of you in any way I can. I want you guys to help me make the next video. I do have some stories to tell still, but the next video I've had a lot of questions you guys have asked me. And it's hard to just address them, one here and one there. So the next video are going to be all the answers from all the questions I've got from you guys, either through Messenger, uh, on the comments. So if you have some questions you'd like to ask, get down in the comments on this one. Let me know what they are, and I'll answer it in the next video. And they'll be back in around two or three days. I'll be back on here because I am feeling a lot better. That was one of the reasons I waited so long to come back, because once I came back, I wanted to be able to stay back and not keep taking those breaks and missing those times because the algorithm needs me to be consistent for the channel to grow but i want to thank everyone who subscribed and been there for me and checked on me all you guys thank you i love you for it man hope you all had a great mother's day mothers are very important the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world bubba and don't you ever forget it but as a man the most important thing you can ever do is be a good father uh, and with that i'm going to jump into my story today 
I've had Chad ask me this question when I did his channel, uh, the interview on his channel, and I, I got sidetracked and didn't really answer it. And I had someone else ask it, but I hadn't really answered it. wanted to save this one for my channel. What it was like to go home from prison from the age of 15 after 20 years. What was that day like? Happiest day of my life. Thought I would make a video about that today. Something good instead of something bad. And we'll get to the bad stuff later. So, I wish that I could put it in a bottle and let you, let you taste it, sprinkle it on you, man. Let you know what it felt like to come home after all those years in prison. I'm going to back it up just a little and we'll go through that day. But what I want to say is there's a great moral to this story. And the moral is perspective. The way you see things. I preach it all the time. Hope that you pick up your blessings and throw down your curses today. Well, that, that means something, man, because the way your day goes directly is a result of how you face it. The mood you're in when you get up against it. You can do everything that you have to do. You can do it in a good mood or a bad mood, and that really matters how that goes for you. So, after all those years being in prison, as you know, if you've watched all the videos, my wife was a guard at the last prison I was at. You have to go watch that video if you want to know about all that. I want to tell that story here. But it was, my, my wife was a guard at the last prison I was at. It's a title. Maybe it's a convict met an angel. It's one of those two, but you can find it. Well, she was a guard at the last prison, and this guy tells on us. I end up in lockup because I'm talking to her on the phone. I was in lockup. I was in solitary confinement for the, for the whole week or two before I got out of prison. They had me in solitary confinement because her ex-husband was a lieutenant on that yard, and her sister was a sergeant on that yard. And now they fired her. They've accused her of having an inappropriate relationship with me. They've got me in lockup. They're trying to get me to admit that me and her had some kind of physical touch so they can try, file rape charges on her. But I'm not admitting none of that. I'm, I'm telling them, look, it's me pursuing her. We ain't touch. We're just talking. So the only thing they could end up getting her for was lying about it because they had us talking on the phone on the recording. And when they asked her if she was talking to me, she said no. So they ended up giving her a charge, a felony for lying to a federal investigator during an investigation. It's the only thing they could get us for. But she ended up getting a two-year deferred sentence because of it. And they've got me down here in lockup. And the only reason I was going home that day was because of my good time. Because I was on the highest level. But if they drop me down a level or take some of my good days for this, I wouldn't go home. So I'm sitting down here in solitary confinement for over a week. Wondering, am I going home or am I not? After all these years, man, every time I would get close to going home, get so excited at the thought of going home. You look at it like a Christian looks to go into heaven. Uh, and that is the truth. When you're laying in that prison, all you can think is, if I can just get out of here, everything's going to be great. Just like Christians imagine, once they die, they're going to this perfect place. And I would think, if I could ever get out of this bad place, everything's going to be so good get so excited about it and then you don't get to go and it is the most heartbreaking despair you can imagine and so I was so afraid all the way up to the end that they were going to change their mind and, and take my good days and put me on the lowest level and that I wouldn't go home until I did the whole 22 year sentence because I had to do 22 in prison and then 12 more out so I had 34 with 12 suspended you can google Ricky Dye McLeod Oklahoma see all about it but just keep in mind everything the news says isn't true. It was mostly true. If you watch my videos, you'll see the truth. I don't lie about anything. It's over. I've done my time. I've finished my suspended sentence. I have no reason to lie. Uh, but the important thing about this story today is that I have everything today and more than I had that day. The day I got out, I didn't have nothing. Nothing at all, just the clothes on my back. There were some clothes my mom had come across, some hand-me-downs people were passing around she thought might fit me, she hung in a closet. That's what I started with. My brother had a trailer that no one stayed in because it was pretty rough. Couldn't drink the water. Me and my wife went there and stayed there. I carried the water over there. We'd shower at my mom's house. She couldn't tell me it wasn't heaven. I'm telling you now, the day I got out was the happiest day of my life. And I have so much more today than I had then. And yet, I don't feel the same happiness. And why is that? It's because we take for granted the things that we have once we have them. You never, you never think about the starter on your car. 
until your car don't start because it's down. Then you think about your starter. You have so many things to appreciate that you don't appreciate. The roof over your head, if you're watching this on a phone or a TV, the fact that you can do that, the fact that you can take a shower when you want to, all those things are not given to you. Those are all, those are all things that are extra. Being able to go in my kitchen, fix anything I want to eat whenever I want it. A lot of times I'll go in there and do that, and then I'll tell my wife, can't make something like this in prison at 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> so I still do appreciate all those things, and um, I think I appreciate things that most people don't. But that day, they come down there, and they finally, when they say that I'm going home, I've worried about it every second of the day. I've been in solitary, and usually what they do, if you're about to go home after a long period of time, been locked up 10, 15, 20 years, they don't want to just take you from a medium or max security prison, put you back out there around people. Because you're used to fighting at the drop of everything, saying any little disrespect. And now you put you out here around all these people that you can't even threaten. And people say any old thing to you, man. Like you ain't going to do shit. And uh, it was really hard for me to deal with. And it still is to this day. I was playing a game with my buddy the other night, Modern Warfare. And a dude called me a bitch and I went off. I can never see this dude. Never going to meet him. Don't even know what he looks like. But he had me so mad I couldn't see straight. He called me a bitch. So things that are very, very serious and intense in prison just aren't out here. They come down and get me, and when they get me out of solitary and tell me, you are going home. So the first thing you do is take me over, take you to medical. If you owe anything to medical, you got to pay that out of your savings before you go. You deduct it from your savings. You got to take you to the library. If you've messed up any books, you haven't returned some books, you have to pay for them or return them. Take you up to property and sign your stuff out. You get your box. You carry your box. I'm walking around the yard and everybody's telling me, Bye, Ricky, die. Holler at you. Glad you're going home. And so they're all so happy for me. These guys that have known me, been in prison with me for years and years. Some of them doing life, never going home. But they see me going home. And in a way, they're living through me. But when you see your best friends going home and you've been in there 15, 20 years and you're still not going home, it's a, it's a real depressing feeling too to be the one that has to stay. They took me down there and they put me in a cell, gave me some clothes. My brother and my mom, I picked out some clothes for me. My brother, I told him I wanted a black Nike hat. They had me one. He had me an Affliction shirt, a pair of 501 blue jeans, a pair of new Nikes. Had more clothes like that in 20 years. I put those clothes on. I was standing there looking out this little cell, waiting on them to let me out. They were waiting to get the paperwork signed and sign me out. And I'm sitting here in this cell in Central Control and I can see through the windows and there's my mom. My brother and my sister and my stepdad out there waiting on me. And they're waving saying, there he is, there he is. We were all excited. And I was still so afraid that any minute these motherfuckers were going to come get me and tell me, take these clothes off. They've made a mistake. I'm going back to lock up. I just knew they were going to get me, man. So I was so excited. But at the same time, I was scared to death. It wasn't going to happen. So finally, they take me and take me out there. And my mom grabs me and hugs me and starts crying. My mom says, get him out of here before they lock him back up. And I felt the same way. So we all took up out of there. My brother grabbed my property box and took it to the van. They had went and borrowed a van to use to bring because my sister, both my brothers, my mom, they all wanted to be there to pick me up. Nobody wanted to get left out from picking me up. My grandma wanted to pick me up too, but we were coming to her house for a get-together, for a welcome home Ricky. And she had prepared, she sent me and wanted to know what all I'd like to eat when I got out. Dude, I had a list of shit, deer meat, uh, roast beef, uh, fried <laughs> catfish. I mean, I listed everything that I had been wanting to eat all that time. And they had every bit of it. Every pie, every dessert, every side dish, everything that I put on that list. And it was a full piece of paper was here to eat that day. So they get me out here to this van. They all wanted to ride me. So we get out to the van. And I said, where's Monica at? Because I had wanted Monica to be with them to pick me up. I wanted to hold her hand in the parking lot and wave at them when we left. <laughs> and that was the plan originally. She was going to quit right before I went home. And she was going to pick me up. We were going to wave at them when we left. But they ended up, we, we ended up getting, I ended up in lockup. If you watch that video, you'll see why. And, uh, yeah. So she didn't get to pick me up, but my mom was like, she's going to meet us halfway. So what I'm telling these guards had sent word through her sister to her that if she got with me when I got out, they were going to lock her up and they're going to get me and lock me back up. And I'm like, there's no way they can lock me back up. I discharged my sentence. She's like, well, but they might, 
my mom said, they might lock you up though, Monica. And Monica said the most G shit I've ever heard. It made me knew that she loved me. My mom said she had always wondered, but when my wife said this, she had no doubt. My mom said, Monica, if you go and meet him, they're probably going to lock you up. I don't think they can do anything to him, but they'll lock you up. And she said, that's okay, as long as I get to spend a little time with him first. Never had to prove anything to me again. So she met me halfway. She had her car full of camping equipment. I think part of her thought I wouldn't call. She was afraid that maybe I had just, everyone told her the whole time we were talking in there that I was just using her, that I was not going to be with her when I got out. The inmates always said that to guards. That they wouldn't stick around. I wouldn't act the same. Everyone was telling her all these bad things about me, trying to convince her not to do it. And um, she did it anyway. She had all her shit in the back of her car. She was fixing to leave one way or another, she said. She was hoping I would call, and I called, and here she come. We met her halfway. My brother took her car and went and hid it in a shop at our house in the garage so that in case, in case they were looking for her, they wouldn't be able to find the car. And she got in the van with me, and the first thing we did, we went to the bank. I had my savings. You had to go cash your check, get your savings. I had $178. So every month, if you work while you're in there, it, you make at least $12 a month if you have some special job that you usually don't have in medium or max. You have to be at a minimum to make more, but... If you work at a job, you get $12 a month, they'll take $1.80 out and they'll save it for you till you get out. You get to use $10.20 of what you made that month. And at the end of that time, if you saved up at least $50, they'll just give you your check, whatever it is. But if you haven't saved $50, they will give you $50 anyway. You get at least $50. But if you've made more, you just get what you made. But I want to go to the bank, cash my check, have my $178. That's all I had to my name was the clothes on my back and that $178. And I was 35 years old and never drove a car and didn't have a license, didn't have a home, nothing. But I was the happiest I ever been in my life. Remember that part. So next thing we did is I wanted to buy a pack of cigarettes. I wanted to buy a pack of cigarettes even though I didn't smoke. Because <laughs> I went to prison when I was 15 years old and I wasn't old enough to buy cigarettes. So it was just something to me to be able to walk into a store as a man, buy a pack of cigarettes with my own money. Of course, you got to have an ID. So when you get out of prison, they give you this little ID that is uh, not a driver's license, an ID. It's a prison ID basically says who you are. And it's legal to get cigarettes with or to use it to cash a check or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. So uh, I go in and I buy this pack of cigarettes. Me and my little brother go to the bathroom. And we get in there. Man, when I went to prison, everything had a handle. You hear me? We go in there, we take a piss. Can't find a handle to flush the stall. It just starts flushing on its own. I go around, my brother's done got his shit and went on. I, I'm looking at these other guys using the, over here washing their hands. I'm trying to wash my hands. I can't get the water to come on. There's a motion detector. I could not figure that shit out. Eventually, I accidentally got it to come on. But the guy next to me, I jumped over and used this. <laughs> I don't remember exactly how I got my hands washed, but... Then I had trouble with the paper towels. I ended up getting one. I ended up wiping my hands on my clothes, as a matter of fact, because I couldn't get one. As soon as I got back out there, I told him, brother, man, you left me. You left me. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, dude, I couldn't figure out how to get the water on and the paper towels. And he's like, oh, my gosh, we never even thought of that, that the world had changed that much. Next thing we did was stop at Brahms. I wanted a banana milkshake. Never, never knew anything about uh, frozen yogurt. You know, I could have got that without my stomach hurting, but I didn't know no better. I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> I drank that milkshake and paid for it the next several hours. Uh, still the happiest day of my life with a terrible stomach ache. Next stop was here to my grandma's house. We come here to my grandma's house, and uh, there's over 50 people here for me, all my family. Love them all so much, and they all came just to see me come home and a lot of them I didn't even know. They were born after I went to prison. And some of them were little kids. And now they were grown and had kids. So it was so strange to me. It was so strange to me. I was so happy. And there's all my family. And even though they're all my family, I didn't know if I belonged anymore. I, I felt so out of place that day. Kept waiting on the police to pull up. Kept thinking the cars were going to come any minute and arrest me. I, I remember I felt that way for the first month I was out. I was always thinking that for one reason or another, they were going to come arrest me and lock me up couldn't imagine to being free and it staying that way and they had all that food here and we all ate together and took pictures and then I wanted the first night with my wife to be very romantic I wanted to leave an impression she she had been married before and 
And we weren't that young. I was 35. She's 40. She couldn't tell it. She don't look any older than me. Um, and I wanted it to be special. So I snuck next door. Next door, my aunt and uncle live over there. And I had them make me a disc with a bunch of love songs on it. You know, the little mixtape. More or less like we used to make in the 80s. <laughs> they have this disc of all these love songs. And uh, then I want to go to Walmart. And I, I have my mom and them keep my girl, my wife over here for a minute while I run over here and I buy her some roses and um, I buy some candles, some incense candles. So the plan was, when we were done eating, me and my wife is going to go to this trailer there next door to my mom's. My grandma and mom is going to rent me a motel for the first few nights. But I said, no, I'm going to be living over there. I'll stay in that trailer. So we go over that trailer and uh, the plan was for me and her to take a shower together and then go to the bedroom, make love. So I've managed to sneak around behind her back. And um, I put rose petals all over the bed and a trail of them from the bathroom. While she's in the bathroom, I run there and put these on the bed, set my candles up all around it, lit all these candles, put on this slow love music, made a little trail of rose petals to the bathroom. She's in the bathroom, don't see all this shit. And we're supposed to take a shower together and we come take a shower, dude. I was so fucking nervous. I tried my best to talk my way out of that shower. I guess I was going to try to stay naked until it was dark. <laughs> I didn't want her to see me naked. No woman had ever seen me naked before. So we were going to take a shower together. My first shower with a woman. I was so fucking afraid, man. I was more afraid than I was getting a shower in Macau store with all them dudes. Never been with a woman before. I was afraid I was going to embarrass myself. But that went pretty good. And when we got out of the shower, we dried off. She starts to put, you know, her little thing on. And I picked her up, carried her through the hallway, set her on the bed. And she says, like, it's kind of dark in there. She's like, what's all over me? <laughs> and, she like, and then she realized the rose petals like oh my gosh so then we get the rose petals off the bed and I won't tell you the rest of what happened because once we got that far I figured it out so the whole point to this story is that was the happiest day of my life simply because I got to come home but I have all those same things today and I wager you do too if you just stop and think about what you have I bet you have everything I had that day and more don't make someone have to take it away from you before you appreciate it. Take advantage of the things you have in your life. Be thankful for it. Every day you're alive, count it a blessing, whether it's a good one or a bad one, because it is, it is a blessing. But many, many days it's going to be up to you. Whether Did you get up this morning and pick up your blessings thinking about all the things you're blessed with in your life, the people who love you? Or did you get up this morning pissed off? Because that's going to decide whether you're happy or not. I hope, my friend, that you'll pick your blessings up. And with that, May God bless, keep, and protect each and every one of you until the next video. Peace out.